Um, hi everyone, my name is Viviana Romero. Thank you for joining all, uh, joining me all in this session. Um, I'm excited to just uh, share with you a little bit more about the liberal arts um, college experience and then talk a little bit more about the Rutland um, University as well. So we'll then go ahead and get started. All right, so what is a liberal arts college and um, you know, should you apply as first gen? I, um, I'm a first gen student as well. I graduated from UC Santa Barbara, um, got my bachelor's in global studies. Then I went on to um, get my master's in higher education at Loyola University of Chicago. Um, so I love education. I love helping students. I think for me, um, my undergrad experience really provided me those opportunities where I solidified what I wanted to do after graduation. Um, so I'm a proud first gen student. I'm happy to be presenting to you all and sharing a little bit more about me and a, lot, a little bit more about um, higher education as well. Fun fact about both of these institutions that I went to, neither of them had a football team. So I'm actually not really like a football fan, um, but I know a lot of people um, <laughs> love football. So, you know, sports is a big thing uh, for you in college. Um, definitely look into it because you're gonna be there for a long time. Um, I was born and raised in the Inland Empire, so I'm very familiar to Southern California. Um, and I also, um, now I, I'm working as an admissions counselor at the University of Redland. So um, like I mentioned, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I work a lot with um, high school students and their parents um, as they're kind of making that college selection, picking what university they're um, gonna be going to and then um, seeing if Redlands is gonna be that good fit for them. So now that I shared a little bit more about myself, I want to like, get to know you a little bit more as well. So please use the chat box um, I, uh, and go ahead and introduce yourself with your name, high school, your class year, um, what is your high school mascot as well? Um, if you wanna answer either of these questions, what is something that you're looking um, to forward the most when you're thinking about college. And right now, who do you consider some of your support systems? So I'll go ahead and give you a few minutes um, to fill it out. Um, you can also feel free to fill it out as you're, um, as we're watching the presentation as well. So um, I think for us now navigating this virtual world, um, I know it's also important to make some connections. So hopefully um, as you all are introducing yourselves, you're able to make see some students that may also maybe be in Southern California or if you're out of state, um, trying to see um, what high school you all are going to and make some connections there. So I'll go ahead, yeah. Um, and leave this up for a few a few more seconds, just in case you know there's more students that want to um, share their information, and then we'll go ahead and move on. Yay! More presenters. Okay, I see. Yeah. Um, Alicia, hopefully I said that right from LA County. Um, high School of the Arts, Lava Junior, perfect. Um, Jasmine uh, from LA um, High School as well, uh, class, of class of 2021. Also Bob, Bobcat. Um, Kenya from, where is it? This moves so fast. Um, USC uh, 2022. Cool, cool, all right. So rising juniors, sophomores, Venice High School represented. All right, cool, awesome. Well, yeah, feel free to continue to use the chat box, interact with each other. So that way, um, like I mentioned, if you see one of your peers who's also from a similar high school or just location, um, you're making that connection already. Okay. So first little kind of um, uh, poll that I wanna do with you all, what do you know about a liberal arts college? So um, if, you know, for A, if you know what a liberal arts college and you're applying, you know, click that choice. Uh, for B, if you've heard of liberal arts colleges, but don't know quite, you know, 
what they're all about. Um, C, you know, you've never heard of a liberal arts college and this is a, like just a brand new topic for you. Okay, so a little bit of, um, you've heard a little bit, uh, don't know. Well, that's perfect. Um, hopefully this presentation gives you more context into what liberal arts colleges do and kind of uh, what we have to offer. Thank you for all of your participation. Um, so what is a liberal arts college? So liberal arts college is a college or university that emphasizes on undergraduate study. So for the most part, um, all of the faculty teaching your classes are focusing on you, you know, as an undergrad. Yes, we have some grad students on campus, you know, doing their master's program, but the primary focus is on you. So all of the classes will be taught by your faculty. Um, these faculty members, you know, have their PhD um, for the most part. We also cover, a, uh, we're multidisciplinary. We cover, you know, all of the humanities, natural sciences, you know, STEM and engineering, um, the humanities. Sometimes a misconception students have about a liberal arts college is that um, we don't do the sciences or we just focus on art and music, um, but we actually have everything that you would typically see at a large public or a large private. Um, as well. And so if you are someone that's looking into those sciences, you know, you can still pursue a biology, physics, STEM um, in a small liberal arts university or college. We're also usually smaller in student population. So our campus size tends to be uh, fairly small. So versus maybe a large pub public being like 20, 30,000 30, students, um, you may see a liberal arts be between 2,000 to maybe 5,000 students on campus um, with an average maybe class size of 16 to maybe 20, 25 students. So in regards to that student population, um, we also um, just have these smaller communities for you to be in. Um, we also focus on these critical thinking, strong communication, um, writing skills, other skills that are gonna help you also, you know, transfer these into that next job that you're going to after graduation. So yes, we want you to, you know, pick that major that you're passionate about, that you want to study and that you want to major in. We also want you to learn, you know, about yourself and apply these different skills that will be beneficial in that job search process or grad school you decide to do or professional schools, um, your next steps after graduation as well. Uh, who goes to these liberal arts colleges? So there is really no type of student that attends a liberal arts college or university or any university um, uh, by, the, by far. I'd say um, you're going to definitely need students with diverse backgrounds with, you know, uh, different racial ethnic identities with a different religion with a different socioeconomic status and nationalities for our international students gender identity how they um, decide to identify themselves so you're definitely going to um, be in a very diverse campus um, and it will just depend on that type of community that the university is fostering so um, there is, yeah, no type of students. There is growing populations as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides. Um, but rest assured that for the most part, most campuses have that diversity um, on campus. You'll meet, you know, in-state students, students that are from that same state, whether, you know, it'd be here in California, if it's a, you know, college, a liberal arts college or university outside um, and in another state uh, for international students, them coming in as well. So it's really going to be this hybrid experience from having students that, you know, grew up in that same state to having students from diverse backgrounds. For the most part, we are also in either Division II or Division Three athletics. So there's still strong um, athletic programs at these liberal arts colleges and universities. Some of them are very competitive, um, depending on the type of sport. Uh, I know, um, like I mentioned, some may have like football, some may have, you know, water polo, track, diving, depending on that program that you're, uh, you're thinking about. If you're an athlete, you can pursue um, different athletic programs and these colleges as well. So where are we located? So we're located all over the US. So you can see there's a good handful of liberal arts colleges and universities here in California, but 
Um, we're all over in the East Coast, uh, Midwest, um, Central Cal um, Central US. Um, so we're a little bit everywhere. Um, so if you're someone that maybe is thinking um, that out of state uh, application and thinking about that out of state experience, know that you can still find you know these liberal arts colleges in these places where you're going to experience the same things if you were here in California. Yes, there'll be a new location and um, a new community as well, but in regards to what it is typically experienced in the liberal arts colleges with class sizes, faculty um, available and uh, majors offered, you'll have that uh, well-rounded experience as well. So. Um, I know uh, with the pandemic, students have shifted kind of where they would like to study, but hopefully um, if that's something that you're still planning to do for the future for our rising sophomores and juniors, if you're thinking out of state, this hopefully gives you a better picture of where you can also um, look into applying. So what are some benefits I would say? So for students in the liberal arts colleges, um, the tuition for the most part will be the same for both in and out of state students. So there is no kind of difference of out of state students are going to be paying more because um, they're out of state students. Um, the tuition is the same. So that's something that you'll know um, if you're applying, you know, to New York to um, one of their universities over there, then you know you're going to be paying the same tuition as that New York resident. Um, your faculty will also know your name due to that smaller, you know, um, campus and the community that we have. Our faculty are very engaged with you all. So the class sizes, like I mentioned, tend to be from that 15, 17, sometimes 20 students. So um, your faculty will get to know you and you can ask them questions that maybe um, you would have either considered doing during office hours or need to schedule another appointment. Um, you could just ask them in class or wait after class and, you know, utilize that time. So that really, uh, small student, uh, small uh, student to faculty ratio allows you to just have these open conversations with the faculty in case, you know, you're maybe thinking about research or you're thinking about um, some summer internships and you want to talk about some options or some internships that, you know, you're thinking about applying um, you can, uh, you know, talk to them about it. You, if you need a letter of rec, you know, during college, you also need to build your relationships with your faculty. And so um, whether it's, you know, faculty within your major or, you know, that one, you know, uh, psychology class that you loved and you, you did really well and you got to talk to the professor and you met them and you, you maintained a relationship, that could be someone that you, you because you cultivated that relationship, then you could go back and ask for that letter of rec because not only do they know you by your name and you know your academic performance, but they also knew you through the overtime of maybe like your undergraduate if you were um, involved in some other clubs or the things that you were doing. So um, definitely, you know, utilize those spaces because um, at the liberal arts colleges, a lot of students feel very supported by their faculty. Uh, you will also receive a well-rounded education and by but by what I mean is uh, well-rounded is that students will not only be able to, yes, pick that major that you want to do, but you're also going to be doing other, um, for the most part, liberal arts like requirements. Typically in, in a maybe like a UC Cal State, you'll do, you'll do your other um, general ed requirements. And so it's similar, but just we call it a liberal arts in, uh, requirements. And so these classes are the classes that kind of challenge you to take um, classes that are in a different uh, uh, field that than your major and you'll be you know uh, learning just different materials um, where you're going to be uh, having this like broader perspective broader knowledge that's also going to contribute to you know um, the major that you're pursuing so it's going to complement your education um, it's about you know um, really maximizing your undergraduate years and taking those classes that maybe um, aren't just required in your major, but it could be a fun class, it could be, you know, a research class, or it could be um, an independent course where you're, you know, doing your own um, 
uh, yeah, research or your own um, scholarly uh, journals and peer reviews. So it's really, yeah, maximizing the educational experience. So that way, you know, at the end of your four years, you know, not only were you, you know, pursuing your, you know, degree title, but you were also able to just uh, maximize that, that inside and outside of the classroom experiences. We also have great financial aid packages. So um, a lot of liberal arts universities offer merit scholarships as one of um, their financial aid uh, awards. And within these merit scholarships, they can range from like 10 to $15,000 to up to maybe 25, $30,000. Um, and these scholarships, um, you would, uh, with your completed application, the admissions committee will then review your, app, your application and then decide kind of where um, you're gonna be awarded these scholarships. There's, you know, full need scholarships as well. If, you know, you submit your FAFSA application and with your EFC, your expected family contribution, um, you get a demonstrated uh, need of zero, then, you know, that liberal arts college can look into your application and your FAFSA um, information and see if you uh, will be a recipient of a full need scholarship because of your financial situation. So there's um, additional scholarships that um, can be offered to you depending on um, your completed application and your uh, FAFSA application as well. Uh, for the most part, we also offer free fee waivers. So in case you, you know, have exa you've um, exhausted all of your fee waivers um, in the common app, um, other coming up applications that you've submitted, um, you can always ask for another one. Just make sure to email the admissions inbox of that university or get in contact with your admissions counselor and they can send you those fee waivers um, because we wanna make sure that we're also providing um, that resource for students as well if they need it. So now I kind of want to get to know some of your interests. Uh, so what is kind of your criteria for a college or university? Now that I shared a little bit more about liberal arts and kind of where they're located, what we offer, what you can expect to experience. Um, are you thinking, you know, more is location most important to you? Where is this somewhere in state? It, can I go visit my family on the weekends? Will you know, I be able to move around? Transportation is important. Um, is it cost, you know, financially, can you afford it? Um, majors available, do they have what you wanna study? Um, or are you maybe um, in between two majors and you wanna make sure both of those majors are offered there? Or maybe you're undecided and you wanna have a good selection of majors. Uh, for student life, you know, are you, you know, are you looking for, you know, that, you know, football experience, you know, high spirit? Um, are you looking for maybe uh, Greek life, fraternities and sororities? Are you looking for on-campus living um, or other? What is uh, some of those other options that um, kind of drive your uh, search when looking at colleges and universities? Okay, so I'm seeing a mix of uh, location, the cost, uh, student life, majors. Cool, cool. Yeah, so that's good that you all are looking into multiple things. It's not just one thing that is your sole indicator of this is what I need to be focusing on because as um, you're going through, you know, you're building your college list, you're going through the admission requirements, you're getting to maybe participate in some of these virtual events or looking at uh, the brochures that the university sent to you uh, via mail. Um, it's important to think about these things because not one thing is going to hopefully, you know, be that driving factor that's gonna separate what, what university you're gonna be attending. Um, but it's multiple things that can be affecting your decision to to attend the college or university. So some first-gen takeaways from um, liberal arts colleges. So you will be more than a number. Like I mentioned, we have um, smaller like academic um, classrooms. Um, we have a small like tight-knit community in regards to student life, um, even housing for students that decide to live on campus. Um, not only do they you know, see their peers in the classroom, but when they live on campus, 
for the most part, you'll probably get to know everybody that lives around you. Um, so you do experience that. Um, you, I think you will definitely create that sense of home and community at whichever university you attend. Um, but I think at a liberal arts college, because we are already small in numbers, there's just more opportunities for you to do that as well. Um, for me, I'd say that your education is your legacy. As a For me as a first-gen student and um, now being an educator and helping other students attend this um, dream of theirs to attend college, I'd say that, you know, wherever you do decide to go, what you do in your four years will increase and help you in, you know, that next step of um, your life. And if you are thinking about grad school, if you're thinking about, you know, just working full time and trying to have that stable and, you know, a lifestyle that you want to have, um, your education is really going to mold what you're going to be doing in the future. So it's important to, I think, think about um, just some of the, like you mentioned, like some of those factors that you are thinking about cost and student life, um, because that's really going to also dictate, you know, some of the experiences that are going to be offered to you in um, that college or university. Uh, we, for the most part, all of us have first-gen initiatives. First-gen students are a growing population nationwide. So um, a lot of colleges and universities have, yes, um, summer transition programs where they invite, you know, first-gen students to come and um, stay at the campus, kind of uh, provide either financial workshops, time management workshops, self-care um, sessions, you know, for you all to really get to transition and see what it's like to be on campus before the actual academic year starts. So these summer, these programs happen in the summer. Um, it can vary from being like five days to a week long. Sometimes there are two weeks, um, depending on how, how generous and how uh, planned that uh, program is at the university. And so definitely take advantage of them. Um, ask admissions counselors if they have some of these programs there. So, you know, if you do end up applying, like you're already thinking about some of the opportunities that they have uh, available for you. Uh, we also have the first gen offices and coordinators that run these offices that put on additional programming throughout the year that will help you and allow you to get familiar with all of the resources that are available to you and also um, to just understand what are some of those first gen struggles and things that you're navigating because it is something very um, different than the rest of your peers who maybe had their parents you know both attend college and they have their degrees um, but for you as being the first in your family doing this, you're navigating this for the first time. Um, they also provide uh, book lending programs where um, book buying books in college can get expensive. And sometimes, you know, you end up buying used books or you buy books from upperclassmen or, you know, you find them online. Um, and so definitely take advantage if they do have book lending programs. So that way you're able to also uh, reduce some of those costs and um, fees that you would pay during your, your four years. Um, take advantage of the alumni network. For the most part, everybody has a very active alumni network. So um, if you're thinking about, you know, you're, you want to do something in business or healthcare, um, start making some of the, or start thinking about, you know, some of those programs that that university has for alumni and how they engage their alumni. Because once you graduate from that university, then you'll be that alumni. And, you know, would you like to contribute in the future? How would you, um, you know, have that bond with some of the the, the future, you know, scholars that are going to be there as well. As for fee waivers, I love to give out fee waivers. So I'm not going to uh, be shy about saying that more than once. And this will be a new um, environment for you to cultivate this supportive um, community um, as you're navigating college. So definitely, um, from what I can see, you all are already thinking about multiple things that are driving that, that college search um, and what you're thinking about. And so just know that this is something that will be that, that new experience, but it's something where you're not going to be doing alone because you will build that community of support and you're going to have other people that are going to be cheering on for you as well. So now um, I'd like to share a little bit more about Redlands um, specifically. Um, we are also a small private here in Southern California. So we are about um, an hour from LA. We are closer to the mountains. You can see from my background. <laughs> um, we're closer to San Bernardino, Riverside, like Palm Springs area. Um, so not too far. 
we um before uh before i continue i want to share some of the other first gen um, statistics as well um 33 of the college students today are first generation students um, in 2015 and 16, 59% of the first-gen students um, attending college were the first ones in their family to do so. So they, this specific class would have graduated either this year or they're going to be graduating next year. So that's something huge because like I mentioned, this population is a growing population. So, um, and more college and the universities are recruiting first gen students, but it's also about the support that they provide once you get there and how they retain you. So um, we at Redlands have 34% of our students that are first gen. Um, and like I mentioned, we are definitely cultivating those resources to make sure that we're providing adequate support for them as well. Uh, these are some of the support systems that we um, provide for you all as first-gen students. So we do have a first generations program that um, allows students to, you know, get familiar with the university a week before um, orientation starts. So how you can see that happening at Redlands is our summer bridge program happens um, a week before orientation. And then um, during that program, during that one week, you're living in one of our first year residence halls. Um, you're meeting students from all parts of California and out of state. Um, there's two faculty um, presentations um, and talks for students. Uh, you get to attend as if you were a student already to kind of see um, that classroom experience. And even though it's informal, um, some students feel nervous and take it seriously, but it's just to kind of introduce that academic experience into you. Um, and then there's sessions, yeah, on self-care. There's a field trip that they take you um, to the beach to have like a fun social day. Um, we're about, yeah, like an hour and 20 from like Huntington and Venice and um, the coast. So um, there's, yeah, different programs that we do to get you just acclimated. And then once Summer Bridge ended, ends, then orientation begins. And during orientation is when you do your class registration. Um, that's when you also get to um, move in into your residence hall. You get to um, attend other programs that the resident assistants have done. Um, there's parent programs as well for your families um, to attend. So it's really having this you know, transition for you to get acclimated to the university, but then also get connected with our staff and our resources that we have for you as well. Um, we have a peer mentoring, peer mentoring program for all um, academic years. So if you're a first year student, you can enter in that peer mentoring program or sophomore, junior, seniors. Um, it's upperclassmen that uh, mentor first year students. So um, they're able to get, just give you advice on some of the things that, you know, maybe they struggled with, some advice that you should know about whether it's class registration or how to get involved. Um, if you're thinking about, you know, those internships or, you know, you already have your life, um, some of those life plans that you want to do, thinking about uh, the time frame of when you can be doing that. We also provide faculty mentoring. Um, Faculty can sign up to be mentors to undergraduate students and students um, develop also this one on one mentorship program with their faculty where they meet a few times during the semester um, to make sure um, you know you're doing well if you have questions about anything they're there as a resource. Uh, we also participate in the I am first um, celebration which happens on November 8th so that's celebrating all first gen students from um, across the nation. And um, we typically like have a photo booth, we have music, we have food, we give out free buttons and stickers. Addie is our mascot. She is a bulldog. She's so adorable. If you ever look up, you know, she, uh, at the University of Redlands, you can probably see a picture of her. Um, but she's always there at that event. And it's just a way to, you know, celebrate you all that you, you know, made it to college, you're here, you're enrolled, you know, you're enrolled, you're attending classes. Um, it's a moment to just be prideful. Um, we also have that book lending program. So we do have uh, that program uh, for you all to, you know, look at books that you're going to be needing for your classes and um, borrow them for that semester or for, you know, that year um, if you're taking it uh, multiple times, um, just so that way you don't have to pay for, you know, that brand new book. 
Uh, we also have other programs that foster the community building. So there's additional events that are happening on campus, um, whether it be through a club, an organization, or maybe a conference that we're hosting um, that you'll be welcome to attend. And we also have a schedule for family programs as well, because we know how important family uh, play a role in um, the lives of first-gen students. So we want to make sure that we provide additional um, programs for them, for them to be part of your college experience. With our academics, like I mentioned, we are a little smaller. We have about 2,400 students on campus um, coming in from all parts of state. In say 60% of our students are California residents. The rest are a mix of out-of-state and international students. Um, what's unique about us as well is our academic calendar. We have a 441 academic term where students are able to, um, you know, do your traditional fall semester from August to December, then your spring from January to April, and then May is our May term where students can either um, take an additional class instead of doing it in four months, they do it in four weeks. They can uh, decide to do a study abroad program that can go into the summer because we don't require summer school or offer it. So you have those two to three months to yourself um, to you know take a breather, catch up, uh, uh, do something. Um, we also have uh, any um, research or internship opportunities that you can do during that month. Um, because like I mentioned, you'll have those two to three months. So I know some schools tend to, uh, some schools may take a break in January. They have a January term. We just have it in, at the end of the year. So that way you're still done uh, by the end of May and then you have summer uh, to yourself. We offer, yeah, that breadth and depth of various academic programs. We have a little bit over 50 programs um, that are gonna help give you those skills. Um, like I mentioned, helping develop you as a critical thinker, a reader, um, giving you that exposure into that different learning topic that uh, maybe, yeah, you, you wouldn't consider taking that, you know, religious class because you're like, well, that's not my major requirement, but because of our liberal arts requirements, it's one of the uh, uh, classes that can fulfill that requirement. And then you may learn that, you know, you really like religious studies or maybe that you don't, but at least you took it and you absorbed that new material. These are all of the majors that we have available. Um, our average class size at Redlands is 17 students and our student to faculty ratio is 13 to one. Um, none of our majors are impacted. So everything that you see on here, um, you can you know major or minor, except for the ones that have an asterisk, those are minors only. Um, but everything else, you can do both. A lot of our students um, end up double majoring because they have this security that they will get the class that they need um, for their major and still graduate in four years. Um, I'll go uh, briefly over just two, just because they have the numbers and sometimes students are curious to know what that is. So for our engineering three, two, um, that's our collab, pro, uh, collab partnership with Columbia University in New York and Washington University in St. Louis for students that are interested in doing engineering. They can, um, well, they will be doing three years of physics at Redlands because we don't have a, a, a school of uh, engineering on campus. And so with this collaboration, as long as they're meeting the criteria of the program, they'll be able to transfer to Columbia or um, Washington University in St. Louis with an accept, uh, acceptance guaranteed and then fulfill their last two years of engineering. And so in five years, they'll have this degree um, in physics from the University of Rutlands and their um, degree in engineering from either of those institutions. For our education for one, students um, are able to complete their teaching credentials within their four years as they're getting their uh, bachelor's. And then if they're interested in doing a master's program, then they could do our uh, one year accelerated master's program. And in five years, they'll have both their bachelor's and their, their bachelor's teaching credentials and their master's as well. Um, I wanted to share this so you all can see it. And then if you have any questions about any specific majors, we can definitely talk about it at the end. One of the other initiatives that we have at Rutlands is our Rutlands Promise, which guarantees students a four-year graduation timeline. I know that nationally, um, the graduation years are changing depending on, you know, impacted majors, um, 
a wait list um, when once you're at the university or in, um, in admission in the admissions process or switching majors. And so what you can find at Redlands is that security and guarantee that you will graduate in four years. If for some reason that doesn't happen because you weren't able to get, you know, that class for your biology major or political science, then Redlands will pay for that extra class or, you know, class this if it's more than one for you to graduate from Redlands. This is an initiative that grew out of out of an assessment that was done um, that was tracking students retention and graduation rates. And that assessment proved that 85% or more of our students were graduating in four years. And so now uh, the Office of the President made this a, a promise, an official promise that you, know, you will have that four year graduation guaranteed. And then if yeah, for some reason that doesn't happen, then uh, the University of Berlin's will pay for that extra class. Um, so if you're someone that's looking on that four-year graduation um, timeline, maybe Redlands could be a good fit. You know, if we have, you know, the major that you're looking for or something that, you know, you like, um, always give yourself an option. One of the uh, programs that we have is our Cal Grant A for tuition guaranteed. So for our um, California students, like I mentioned, 60% of our students are California residents. So we started this to... Um, uh, uh, what is it? Um, uh, initiative. I forgot the word for a moment. Initiative uh, for you to um, come to the university to keep that retention of students at the university. And so what happens is if through the FAFSA application, you are identified as a Cal Grant A student and in your transcript, you have a cumulative 3.5 weighted GPA then the University of Redlands will pay for your full tuition. Right now, our full tuition is about 50,000 and something. Um, and so if you apply to the university and you meet this criteria, then you won't have to pay for that $51,000. And so then the rest of your, tu uh, your tuition, your financial aid would then go to, you know, your housing or student fees, or you can use, you know, to buy your, you know, your book expenses um, and things like that. And so this is one way where we know as a private, you know, sometimes that discourages students to apply because they think financially they can't afford it or the parents can't afford it or, you know, it's not going to be a good fit for them because they may not see students that look like themselves or um, they just don't know, you know, what private means. And so this is an opportunity where, you know, if you're thinking about that cost and fit and, you know, student experience, um, if, like I mentioned, we have something that you like or you are thinking about majoring, then um, if you apply as a Calgary guarantee, this is a initiative that will cover you for all four years. So this is, uh, initiative is renewable as long as you maintain a B point average every year. Um, so maybe instead of, you know, um, uh, uh, look, taking out loans as uh, some part of your education, you may end up be paying less than you know what you think. So I can get into like specific numbers, but if you do want to ask me at the end some um, students that I've worked with and uh, their situations, I can share. Um, but this is yeah one of the initiatives that we want to support with our California students and our first gen students as well. So if you are thinking about staying in California, um, we like this is a better picture of where we are located. So. The closest airport that we have to us is Ontario Airport for our student, our out-of-state students and maybe international students that are thinking of going home during the holidays. Um, not this year, but any year uh, before, we would offer free shuttles to give students uh, rides to the airport. Um, so that way they're able to go home. Um, we also have the shuttle system that drives students around campus. Even though we have free parking on campus, maybe not all students have a car um, or are able to move around. Um, there is a bus system that runs throughout the city of Redlands, um, but these shuttles also provide just rides for students who need to go grocery shopping or maybe you know they just wanna go to the movies on a Friday night and they, they need a ride or nobody wants to drive. Um, this could be another uh, transportation um, resource for these students as well. Like I mentioned, we're about an hour, an hour and 10 from LA, about an hour and 20 from the beaches. Um, and yeah. Uh, so navigating financial aid. Financial aid gets tricky um, uh, because some students um, 
uh, they may not know exactly what each um, financial aid category means or, you know, how, how to get started on, you know, discovering how much they're going to be paying to attend that specific college or university. So what I would recommend is to, you know, Google that university that you want to go to and look up their net price calculator. This net price calculator is available in all of their financial aid tabs. Um, and then you can calculate um, based on like your family's income and then see, you know, if you're planning to live on campus, if you uh, don't want to live on campus and you're going to be commuting, you know, what are going to be the different prices that you're going to pay. So you can, you know, click, you know, um, those different uh, line items and those categories, and then you can get an estimate. It doesn't mean that that's exactly what you're going to be expected to pay, but it's just going to give you an estimate because like I mentioned, you won't know all of the financial aid that you may qualify for until you apply. So maybe you get a higher merit scholarship that you, than you uh, thought you qualified for. And so then your that net, that cost for the, the, net, the net price calculator will be lower then. Um, so check that out, use that as a resource. I know that helped me when I was applying to um, in college. So if that's something where you, know, you don't know where to get started, this is a good first step. Um, for the FAFSA application, the free application for student aid um, went live October 1st and is due March 2nd. So even if you apply, you know, early action, early decision to a university, um, you will have until that March 2nd to complete your FAFSA application. So don't feel pressured that because you applied early or, you know, you're applying in January, you need to have it done. Um, as long as you include that university that you're applying to in the list of, you know, the universities that you want to receive your FAFSA application will receive that information um, as well. So I always encourage students to submit it um, because there's, yeah, additional aid that you can um, qualify for. Um, I don't believe all universities require it, but we highly recommend it. For our undocumented students, we also encourage you all to fill out the DREAM Act application because that is also going to give us um, more context into your family situation and then see what other additional aid you can qualify for. Um, I know for us specifically, our financial aid office is really good about um, working with und undocumented students and seeing what other aid they can qualify for. We have like additional um, scholarships and um, loans that we provide students who, you know, maybe need um, like an emergency. Uh, money for that one semester or they need additional aid or they appeal their financial aid letter and they're seeing if they can qualify for more. We do have, um, you know, more financial aid, but it just depends on that student's and that family situation as well. For the California grant, um, that's when, you know, uh, that's a grant by the state of California. So for the, that Cal Grant A or Cal Grant B or Cal Grant C, that is also with the FAFSA application. So you do not have to do anything extra. Um, but that's when you'll know if, if you're a Cal Grant A, B, or C student. Um, for institutional aid, uh, there's, so there's three different aid, financial aids that will be offered to you. There's the institutional aid. So for us, there'll be that merit and um, scholarship uh, money, the university grants. Um, for federal aid, that's the California grant. Um, uh, well, no, that's the Pell Grant. If you qualify for like Pell Grant or student uh, student loans and state aid is that California grant. So there's different levels of financial aid as well. So it's just important to know the, the what that university has to offer and what you will be able to qualify for. And then the last one for financial aid is that merit-based or need-based aid. So like I mentioned, some universities will offer like will meet full need if you apply to the university. Um, some universities may only offer that, you know, those large scholarships um, that can be re renewable all four years. Uh, so make sure to explore and give yourself um, a good options as well. Some of the systems of support um, that you can experience, that you can um, have now, um, I'm sure are those uh, family members that are motivating you to go to college, your teachers, your admissions counselors, um, these are other organizations as well that I'm first in College Greenlight. If you all want to know a little bit more about them, they also help uh, first-generation students. 
For our admissions requirements, um, these are our deadlines. So we do have our early action, early decision, November 15th, and our regular decision, January 15th as well. These are our general application requirements. Uh, like I mentioned, we provide fee waivers if you need it for the common app. Um, for your official transcript, we're going to um, recalculate your GPA as well. So we're only going to be looking at your 10th, 11th, and 12th grade classes. Um, we want to look at your college prep courses. So seeing if you did, you know, those, you know, four years of English, your foreign language, um, your uh, sciences and math. And so we want to make sure that we're giving you that best GPA possible as well. Uh, with your letters of reg, you can get it from your, one of your teachers or counselors. If you, you know, are really close to maybe your volleyball coach or, um, you know, your uh, uh, choir um, a teacher in um, your church or something like that, you can get a letter of rec from them, but it'll just be secondary. We want to make sure that we prioritize your teachers or your high school counselors. And um, as of this year, we have moved to being test optional permanently. So um, this is something that our university was moving towards doing um, previously, and now we made this um, official. And so that means that we're no longer going to be requiring students to submit their standardized tests as part of the admissions process. Um, these are some of the uh, profile and numbers from the previous class. We don't have a minimum GPA or test score that you need to apply to the University of Redlands. We um, just share these averages. We, I have you know, worked with students that are above these averages, students that are below. When I'm looking at your application, yes, I want to know how well you're doing academically, but I also want to know, you know, I want to get to know you through the application. So what did you write in your personal statement? Why did you choose that topic specifically? What do your teachers and counselors have to say about you? What were you involved? What kept you busy during your four years when you weren't in school? Um, I want to get to know those areas of you. So for me to know if, you know, Redlands is going to be that fit for you and, you know, what are some of those things that you want to accomplish when you're here? So I always tell students to be genuine because your authenticity is really gonna shine through, um, whether it be through that personal statement um, in your supplemental questions um, with what your teachers say about you. Um, we're gonna be able to read that and just get to know more about you. So this year, um, due to the pandemic, there is also a new question that's on the Common app. Uh, I just wanna spend a, a few um, moments here because this is something new. So. Um, due to COVID, many families and students have either been deeply affected or uh, maybe not as affected as much. But if you feel um, you want to share anything with us, um, just know that you are going to have this space to do so. Um, it can be, you know, whatever you want. There is no, you know, uh, factor or, you know, qualitative um, number that we're going to give out to students. Um, we just want to make sure that if you feel you want to express something that has affected you now, you have that space. Um, and like I mentioned, um, test optional, that's something that a lot of universities have now shifted to, you know, re looking at their admissions process. Maybe some universities are only doing it for this, you know, fall, uh, uh, fall 2021. Um, but uh, this is something where I mentioned it gives students the option if you feel your best application is with your your test scores then you know go ahead and apply it but if you feel that you know your best application is for your high, high school gpa and your completed application then apply that way lastly i'll just share some other virtual um, admissions resources because i want to make sure we have time for questions um but make sure if you are looking at you know, your university that you're interested in, or if you're looking at us at Redlands, there's a lot of virtual events um, for you to engage in and get to meet other students or faculty or hear other admissions counselor talk about different topics. Um, utilize this space, because now that we've kind of just gone virtual, I feel like everything that you need is at your fingertips. I'm going to leave my contact info here. So in case you all want to screenshot it or take a picture, you can. Um, but I'm ready to answer any questions. So oh, thank you so much. Just a lot of information. Thank you. Um, we do have a few questions. Their first question says, what type of classes will be required to take while attending Redlands? Yes. 
So, um, like I mentioned, we do have our liberal arts uh, requirements um, on top of your general um, major requirements. And so one of these classes I know uh, specifically focuses on um, the global perspective. And so you're gonna be required to take a class that's gonna give you that global perspective, gro global thinking. And so maybe it's a class in um, global business or um, international affairs or um, uh, race and ethnic studies that is um, uh, breaking down an international issue or uh, uh, it has an international lens into it. So um, it's one of those classes that is just going to give you the um, global perspective for you to have just a larger understanding of what's happening outside of the US. One of the other requirements that we have is um, students um, doing like a presentation throughout their four years. So maybe in your, you know, psychology class, you need to present on um, either a research topic or a counseling program, um, something like that. Um, that presentation experience is not only going to, you know, focus on your communication skills, but then also, you know, just give you that ability to be in front of an audience and well, not a large audience, but like your classmates um, and just practice orally, like um, giving you additional skills. So these additional classes, like I mentioned, give you skills that will help you in um, that next step of your life and hopefully um, for you as a person as well. Thank you. And next question is, is, since this is a small school, is it more challenging to get accepted? No, we have a 70% acceptance rate. So we tend to say yes um, more often than not. Um, the, I think students thought I, I'm like, I've been like borderline, like, oh, I think, you know, you could, you, you, you would, uh, you would have been accepted if, you know, something worked out. Um, it's mostly, um, something with either um, having like a really like low, low GPA um, or uh, maybe there is a lot of challenges in high school and I think they may be best to either taking a year or um, doing a different university as well. So I always want to take into consideration, you know, what is happening in your, in your lives. And if there's something where we see it's a consistent um, challenge that students are facing, uh, maybe transitioning into college um, after high school uh, may not be the best option, but we'll definitely have that conversation with you all in the admissions process. Um, but like I mentioned, we tend to say yes more than no. Thank you. We have a request from a few students that are asking if you can go back, I believe three or four slides. Okay. Here, admissions requirements. I think it's the next one. Admission requirements? Admission Maybe. requirements. Admission requirements, okay. Yes, can everybody this see that? Okay, Hopefully. yes. Uh, is this the correct one, Jasmine? The one before this. Making okay. sure. One before is systems, financial uh, aid. So yeah, it's financial aid, Southern California. Admissions, common app and virtual. Hopefully. Um, I'll leave it at admissions requirements so that way um, you all can yeah, see more. Um, but yeah, is there another question? Yes, yes. So the next question is, um, does Rutlands have an, an, an um, animation program? Uh, we don't have like a specific animation major. What happens is with our... Um, uh, art and our, we have an art major where you can do different concentrations. So there is an opportunity for you to do either graphic design or like digital and advertisement. Um, if um, you are thinking of um, 
yeah, doing yeah one of one of those pathways, you can. We also have um, our media and um, culture um, majors, which allows you to learn like some journalism, but then also um, learn about photography and learn about um, some other elements that happen like in the media when broadcasting, um, if you feel that's more of your element. So there is different concentrations within our majors. Um, but since, like I mentioned, we are a smaller university, we tend to just have like one major and then do concentrations in between that. For business, typically that's also what happens if students are thinking about either like real estate or entrepreneurship as their concentration, they can do that within business. Thank you. Next question, does submitting SAT scores make you a better candidate for colleges? Um, I'm going to say no, that's my personal um, uh, bias. I'd say that um, I think for so long, uh, standardized tests have been like, um, you have to take this to go to college, you have to do well, you know, you need to have a good GPA and test score. Um, and I think um, now that um, I think I've, I've gone to grad school, and I, I've worked in different universities with different students, I'd say that you know, you all have a lot of potential beyond your GPA and your test score. Like, yes, that's important. And if you share it with us um, and you want to, you know, let us know how well you did in math or in writing um, or your SAT, I know that's only going to support what you're doing in the classroom, you know, in your, in your transcript. So we're going to see your, you know, progression of the classes that you've taken. And um, if you take, you know, that four years of math, you know, how well you did, um, and so with test optional, I think that just really gives you that opportunity for you to really control how you want us to uh, get to know you. Um, and if you think that your standardized test is going to, you know, support what is already, you know, in your application and your uh, transcript, then go ahead and submit it. If you believe that, you know, your test, your uh, GPA, um, speaks more to, you know, your potential and, you know, who you are and, you know, what you can accomplish, then go ahead and apply that way. I just, I really want to make sure that students are, you all are, as students are thinking about kind of um, what I think about when I'm an admissions counselor, um, because yeah, there's, um, I think different universities I may uh, have you required, um, but I think for us, we want to make sure that we're getting to know you through the admissions process. And so, yes, that's important, but we also want to see what, what else, um, you know, you want to do, you know, here at Redlands or, you know, what you want to pursue, uh, what you want to accomplish. Thank you. Next question is, um, how is experience with the transition to grad school and is grad school um, offered at the University of Redlands? So there's a few another question is, and does financial aid provide um, for grad school students? Yes, so we do have um, four graduate schools um, at the University of Redlands. We have our Graduate School of Education, Graduate School of Business, Graduate School of Music, and Graduate School of Theology. Um, and so if you are thinking about doing a master's of any of these programs, you can definitely do it at Redlands or you could do it at a different university. Um, to have maybe that different experience um, or if they have a program that you're really, really looking into. Um, I'd say that, that the transition for me um, uh, was challenging in the beginning because I graduated in 2015 from UCSB and I started working full time for two years because I wasn't sure if I really wanted to do my master's right away. And then after that two year uh, of working, I applied to grad school. And so that first year was just about like, oh, I have to write essays and I need to balance my time. And I need to, uh, I was working as well during grad school. And so it's, uh, it was balancing uh, multiple uh, responsibilities. And so I'd say for, you know, someone that's thinking about graduate school, um, I I'd encourage you to maybe research that job that you're looking uh, of doing or, you know, what you're interested in because that can also um, uh, tell you, you know, maybe what graduate program you can be doing. Do you need like an administration degree? Do you need an MBA? Uh, is it a, um, a master's in, you know, um, counseling? Um, or 
are you doing like one of the sciences? And so um, sometimes in the sciences, um, they may require you to do research in your undergrad. And so thinking about what research opportunities you can do. And so um, I'd say definitely do research on um, uh, master's programs that you're thinking about, but then also um, looking at those positions that you want to see yourself working in. So that way you're familiar with um, the process. And then as uh, for funding, there is um, the FAFSA application that you can submit as a graduate stu student as well. And then there's um, some aid that's given to you. Um, there's some scholarships that the university may offer um, specifically for graduate students. Um, but for the most part, what I, what I did was the, there was a lot of loans as well. Um, so you can take as many loans as you need. But um, one of the reasons why I went out of state was because I um, wasn't, gonna, wasn't gonna be paying for my tuition. The job that I was working for in Chicago paid for my tuition. So then the rest of my aid that I got was going towards my, um, uh, my student fees and some of other like, uh, 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 yeah, like transportation things that I was doing. And so um, definitely I'd say just um, know that depending on the graduate program that you're doing, um, there may be uh, less uh, like scholarships or grants for you to apply to and more so loans. Thank you so much. The last question, I know that some students had um, already six and might be attending a different session. So the last question is, if a student is identified as special um, ed or in the district, do you have, um, do you know if there's accommodations that the students will get received at Redlands? Yes, so we do provide yeah accommodations for students that um, have um, uh, different learning uh, uh, yeah uh, accommodations. We uh, have our academic support office, yeah, um, and Amy Amy Wilms works closely with those students. So during the admissions process, um, if you know you uh, write that you know you need learning accommodations, so you've had um, a plan in high school what we do is we connect you with Amy. So that way, um, if you want to specifically learn more about the programs that we have, she can provide that as a resource to you. And then um, once you're here as a student, you can also um, take advantage of, we have peer other peer mentoring programs as well. Um, if, uh, for test taking, um, you can have a note taker um, as well. So that way you're not, um, uh, writing all the classes, writing in every single class. Um, so there's definitely additional resources um, that will be provided to you. Um, it would just be a matter of knowing what a kind of accommodations you need. Um, and so that way uh, we'll have that for you.